So for all of those watching, Konbanwa uh, Minasan. My name is Nicola Bartolazzi, and I am from the Barony of the Cleflands. And well, apologize that I'm wearing Italian garb right now. I do kind of try to put on a little bit of Japanese when I teach something of Japanese culture, but I'm also recording a 16th century style play after this because why not? Uh, <laughs> this is probably the latest in the year that I've taught or performed for the SCA, but 2020 is a very strange year. So thank you all for, for coming. Um, we're gonna get started because if you're here, you're here to learn about uh, shogi, which is medieval Japanese chess, although it's not just medieval because they still play shogi today. Um, for those of you who want, we have, uh, I have a handout. The link is in the Zoom description, um, but for those of you who are watching on Facebook, hold on, let me quickly get up the slideshow, and then you, you'll be able to see the link and hopefully easily copy it. Um, the link is to both the handout uh, that well, a handout that I'll be reviewing, although I'm mostly using the slideshow for today, as well as, oh, nope, that did not want to do that, as well as um, the, come on, there we go. Um, the, the top link is for the handout, and the bottom link is actually for printable boards. Um, these are PDFs. If, if for some reason they do not download from Google Drive effectively, uh, please just email me. My email, I give you my email address at the end of, end of this, um, and I can send you the files, but hopefully they do. Occasionally there are restrictions because of how I host them, and people have reported they can't retrieve them even though they're listed as public, but um, they're the files. Uh, not the easiest URLs. Um, I would mostly focus on getting the handout for right now, and I can always email you the boards later. All right, so let's get started. Um, if you have any questions, um, I don't have the Facebook stream up, so hopefully they can be relayed to me or you can email me later. Uh, but if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out and I will try to review and answer them. So what is Shogi? We call it Japanese chess. It literally means though the general's game. Now, if you happen to be, um, now you may be wondering, are we just calling it Japanese chess? But it actually is related to the chess games that we know. Um, we'll see that more in just a little bit. Sorry, I'm also trying to change my view a little bit, but I think we're gonna stay on the screen. Um, so, but it is very much like the game that we are familiar with, but it's also very, very different. So, as I said, it's related to the game that we consider Western chess or international chess. Um, it is a cousin to it. It is a cousin to what is being what was played in Europe, that Europe, and then thus North America, that you're probably very familiar with. Um, shogi is like chess, considered a strategy game, although in Japan, um, like the chess variants of China and Korea, it is also considered a secondary game to Go. Um, Go is a fascinating game. I advise you to go learn from it. I am can sort of teach it, but I am no expert. Um, similar to chess, uh, shogi is played on, on a board that has um, both horizontal and vertical lines marking, marking the spaces on the board. It is made of two armies that are of equal size and makeup. Um, most of the pieces we, we will see are related to the movement and movement and meaning that we see in other chess. Your, your object is to checkmate the opponent king, but what is very different about shogi versus our chess and many other variants of chess is the unique promotion rules and the unique dropping rules of captured pieces. That's the quick overview, but we will go into that once we get through some of the history. And I'm not going to go too deep into this because um, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a reason why I ended up breaking down my chess classes by culture, because one thing I like to say is from almost any culture that you have in the SCA, at least as you go later in period, there will be a chess variant that your, that your persona could have known. 
Um, the earlier periods, no, but as you, but as you get later um, around the uh, middle of the first millennium for much of Asia, by the end of the first millennium and into the second millennium for most of Europe, as well as other parts of Asia, as well as parts of Africa, you start to see chess spreading everywhere. It was very popular fairly quickly. The origins of chess are still debated, but uh, what many people consider is that the origin came from India, from the game, and pardon me, I cannot pronounce um, Sanskrit words, uh, Chaturanga, um, which meaning four limb, and that stood for the four parts of the army, the cavalry, the elephant, the chariot, and the foot soldier. Now this came from the sixth, sixth century as a divination and or military strategy game. It was played um, on, it was played on an existing board that was for race games, but it ended up um, ignoring the marking on the board, though, though the markings on some boards will come, will come into play later on. Um, it had eight by eight squares. It was uncheckered. It had 16 pieces full per side, including a uh, rank of eight pawns. Um, the pieces were intricately carved, carved figurines, and they were played in the inside of spaces. Now, this may all seem a bit trivial, but we'll see how this how this relates to the evolution of chess in just a moment. So here, here is a um, Chaturanga board, although I am using, in this case, uh, the modern equivalent of the pieces, the shapes so you can see what they look like, mostly, um, versus an early shogi board. As you can see, there's definitely some similarities. Um, both boards are uncheckered. Both boards have similar sized armies. In fact, early shogi may have been eight by eight with 16 pieces per side. Um, and they both have the also the commonality of, of the first row is entirely of the same piece, the pawns or the foot soldiers. The rear has um, a few unique pieces. And, in our case with the king and queen are unique pieces while there's duplicates of all the other pieces. The other major influence for shogi comes from Chinese chess or jianqi. I'm again, not cannot pronounce Ch Chinese. So we'll just go with Chinese chess for now. Um, now there are some people who do speculate that China may have been the origin of chess most Scholars seem to, scholarship seems to point towards India and that China adopted it. Um, just like India, is, it is likely there was an older game played on a similar board that was adopted for chess, but it feels more like that chess formed in India evolved through China. And what is actually very interesting is some of the oldest of the Chinese variants, we can speculate what, what they were like because of Japanese chess. So in, in Chinese chess, um, you have, uh, we, know it, we know it arrived around the sixth century. So it was definitely there about the same, just shortly after, after it was created in India. Um, it is also a divination and military strategy game. It is, uh, the, um, there are marks on the board for this one as well, just like in the Indian game that probably predated it. The marks on this board actually ended up being influential in Chinese chess, um, that probably was heavily evolved as time went on, but still those marks, those, the markings in the board probably um, had an impact on early Japanese chess. So um, there were various boards of different sizes because they were utilizing existing boards, not just adopting it. If you think of the Indian game, the Indian game was eight by eight. And that is what ended up migrating to Persia, what migra migrated to the Middle East, Northern Africa, and then to Europe. We still use an eight by eight board for most chess variants today. Um, that's because we sort of kept the board. Now, China probably adopted, probably used a board they had to put the pieces on. Now, a major difference is that eventually China would migrate the pieces to being played at the intersection of the lines at the points instead of the blank spaces between the lines. When we think of board games like chess, we do think of them being played on the spaces between the lines, but that is very uncommon in, in the far, in far East Asian games. If you are familiar with Go, think about that. It's played in the points. If you think about games like um, 
uh, Al Kirks, uh, Nine Men's Morris, um, Fox and Geese, uh, they're all played on the points, not on the spaces bet bet between the lines. They're played, those games are played in the intersection. Many Chinese games are. Many um, games that were probably influenced by China and Korea and Japan and other East Asian nations are um, played, on, played on the points. But Shogi is not. And as we see, chances are early Chinese chess also is not because it was mimicking the Indian game. Um, and that's probably what then came over to Japan was the, was the, was the Indian inspired early Chinese chess that was still played in the spaces. Because again, most games in Japan are played, up, played on, on the points. One difference that eventually happened, and we don't know exactly when, but it was probably fairly early, is um, China replaced the intricately carved figurines for the pieces into flat discs that had Chinese characters inscribed to, dif to, differ to differentiate the meaning. And what's also rather interesting is the modern Chinese chess game, each side has different characters, even though the pieces are painted in different colors, they have different characters, although they represent basically the same thing. You would have two kings and two in um, various foot soldiers. They just would use different characters that had a similar meaning, or at least in the game equivalent meaning. Um, so what we believe is that there uh, definitely were various trade routes from China through Korea that came in multiple waves to Japan. And we've seen this throughout lots of Japanese culture, um, literature, religion, fashion, music. Um, they, many of, they were influenced by China in many successive waves. So chances are, as we will see, Japanese chess was also influenced in these waves. Um, so chances are what happened to is, sorry, I'm getting at my phone so I can keep track of my track all the time. I thought that would be a little bit more smooth. It was not. Um, the other thing I do is comedy. So if I'm, if I'm foolish and confused, that's because it's who I am. Back to Japanese chess. Um, so we do think that flat, the flat pieces with inscribed characters must have come early because every example of shogi has that. Um, uh, shogi has, or Chinese chess has two advisors to the king, whereas most games like, like the Indian chess and European chess have one advisor to the king. Sh Chinese chess has two. Um, early, um, early shogi may have had one, but very shortly thereafter, shogi had two. Uh, Chinese chess had an emphasis on forward moving pieces. They actually restricted some of the more powerful pieces. Shogi inherits that, um, which includes the lack of the powerful chariot piece. We'll cover that in more detail when we get to the pieces. Um, the, original, the original Chinese boards may have actually uh, um, been closer to the original Shogi boards. And the one fi final, one strong clue about er early chess is in most cultures, the king piece is the equivalent word for king in that language. In China, they change it to general. There's some apocryphal stories about why this is the case, but I should say one's the general, one's the governor. But when it comes to shogi, it is, they only have generals and it is literally called the general's game. They don't have kings, king pieces, it is generals. So they probably never heard about it being a king because they would have gotten it from China. Later developments, and I will cover this a lot more detail, is two interesting pieces in, in Shogi, the Hisha and the Kakogyo. Um, they were introduced later in Shogi and probably inspired by later development of Chinese chess. That to Japan was a brand new feature, even if it was actually Chinese chess readopting some old ways. So here is a comparison and you can see very uh, strong comparisons between the two. So we have on the, I should have explained this before, but um, first we have uh, the Chinese chess game and then we have the Japanese chess game. The boards are rather similar in size. The boards have markings which denote uh, a bit different abilities of pieces. The Chinese board has more restrictions on them 
um, in different restrictions, but the Japanese board still has them. Um, we see that there are gap, we see that the pawn line has been moved forward. Um, it's not just right in front of the other pieces, like in many variants of chess, the pawns, the foot soldiers are immediately in front of the more powerful pieces. But in both Chinese chess and Japanese chess, there's a gap. We also see that some of the space between that gap is filled with other pieces. Um, the Chinese chess added some pieces there, and so did Japanese chess. There's one more culture that probably heavily influenced Japanese chess, and I find this one kind of interesting just from a historical cultural standpoint. We do know that there was some significant trade routes between Thailand and Japan before the 10th century, um, and Thailand uh, also had chess. And it was played on spaces, not points. So again, unlike most Japanese or East Asian games, um, like uh, um, uh, pro, like like Japanese chess, um, Thai chess began in the third rank. So the third row forward. The pawns began third row forward. The pawns were promoted um, by flipping the piece over because the pieces, the, the pawn equivalents in Thai chess were actually seashells, just simple seashells. And you could promote them by flipping it from the concave side to the convex side or vice versa, my geometry is out the door. Um, the one final interesting thing is most chess was influenced by Northern Indian chess but Southern Indian chess had some few variants. Nor and one of them was a very different move for the elephant piece, which would eventually become our, bi our bishop. But um, only Southern India and Thai had this movement and Japan. So it is likely that this identical and very different kind of movement that Japan has as the Ginsho, the silver general, was heavily inspired by the Kong of Shogi. Here are the two boards. And again, they look very much alike. Now I am using a slightly modified, very early Shogi board that was not nine by nine, it is eight by nine. But as you can see, it corresponds very closely to the Thai board. You have the gap between the, the foot soldiers and the main pieces. And um, uh, again, you see that all the pawns are flat disks that flip over, and that will actually become very important in shogi when we get to some of the unique rules. Now, now that we've covered some of the history, because it's the SCA, we have to talk about history. You probably came here because you want to actually know how to play shogi. Well, I can tell you, it is not that hard to learn. Mastering it? Okay, that's another story. But if you can learn chess, you can learn shogi. It is very similar in some ways and very unique in other ways. I personally, and not just because I'm a fan of Japanese culture, I personally think that shogi is probably the most fascinating and most interesting adaptation of chess and probably the most successful, at least for what I look for. Um, but some of what makes it very different and very unique um, so again, most of the, well, let me jump back for a second. The, most of the objectives of Shogi are like what we expect for chess. Each side has pieces. You move your pieces according to the rules for the movement of each piece. Your goal is to capture opponent pieces and to eventually put the opponent king in check. Um, you have to strategize. You have to avoid, um, avoid leaving your king in check. Um, eventually checkmate is how you win or it's brought to a draw. You um, a lot of the same rules that you think about for European chess when it comes to the play and the movement are there. Some of the other rules that are late European styles, no, they aren't there. There's no castling rule. There's no pawn initial double step. There's no pawn unpawn un set capture rule for pawns. All that is European um, uh, invented later in period, later in SCA period, but still later. Not every place in the world uses, uses those rules. But the general play is still the same. You have two sides, which are actually usually called black and white, um, though they're 
as we'll see, they're the same color. They're not actually colored black and white, but culturally they're still called black and white, probably because Go uses black and white pieces and as does many other games. Although slight trivia, trivia um, bit, black goes first in Japanese chess and usually in um, uh, European chess, white goes first. Um, so, and it's, um, the other, the other main difference to think about is that it's played in an uncheckered board, but so was European chess until um, several centuries after it was introduced into Europe. So was it for most of, most of the world for half a millennium. So the checkered board doesn't actually limit movement. It doesn't reflect anything other than helping us visualize the board. Japanese chess just it felt like it wasn't necessary. And that does make sense for, a, for how a lot of pieces move. But what makes shogi so different? Obviously, the piece movements are different, which we'll cover, but there's some major rules that I want to cover first. So most chess variants do have a promotion rule. The promotion rule is generally that the pawns will promote upon reaching the final rank, and that's the back row, the side closest to your opponent. And oftentimes, it's usually only the pawns. When they promote, they typically promote into an equivalent of the king's companion. In European chess, that's that's the queen. In many forms of of historic chess, that was the diff that was the the queen's ancestor, which may have had different rules. But still, regardless of how the movement rules for that piece were, whether it was an advisor, a vizier, a general, or a queen, depending upon if it could move very only a little bit or a lot, it was still what the pawn promoted to. Sometimes they'd have various roles that you could only promote one if you lost your queen or only one could promote at a time. Um, there was, every place had different rules. There wasn't really a standardization for it, but essentially it came down to only a pawn could promote only at the back row and only into the king's companion. And this usually had required a physical piece to replace the pawn because obviously the pawn doesn't, doesn't look like um, the queen. So in most forms of shogi, the smaller and medium sized ones, including the main version just called shogi, nearly every piece can promote, not just the pawns. Um, promoting is permitted by reaching the final three ranks of the board, the far side where the opponent is. Now, if you remember um, when I showed you the board, the board had, was nine by nine that had a few marks that the marks had basically were the corners of a three by three square in the middle. But if you look at the marks, they basically show where um, the start of one of one player's player's army, where that starts, and the start of the other player's army. So as long as you can get into your opponent's starting place in the last three thirds of it, past those marks on the board, that is the promotion zone. Um, the different pieces they gained are diff different and sometimes brand new movement rules. So every piece when they promoted, promoted, gained different moves, um, usually improved moves, something better. Many of them, especially in the smaller version of the Shogi, gained the same promotion rule, but they didn't all do that. Um, some of them, uh, many of them promoted into, a, into similar to a piece that already existed on the board, but some gained moves that didn't, you don't start the game with. And that is also a very foreign concept because in chess, you start with equal armies and you know every piece on the board, what it moves. In shogi, you will get piece movements, piece movement rules that didn't exist at the beginning of the game will exist now. Um, promotion is optional unless a piece can no longer move. Some pieces in shogi can only move forward. So eventually there's a point where it's, if it's either, if either in the last or second to last rank, it can no longer move if it doesn't promote. And promotion is accomplished by flipping over the piece to reveal a different character. This is where it gets, I think, historically it gets interesting and a little confusing. Um, so if you go back and look at, um, do I have graphics? Uh, okay. Uh, looking at the handout, the graphics are kind of right there. So here is a good opportunity to look at the shape of the pieces. Now, in Indian chess, they are intricately carved, basically statues. Um, by the time we get to European chess, 
chess pieces are more geometric, but they're still three-dimensional figures. The Chinese chess is, as I said, small, is basically discs of characters inscribed upon them. Come on. But um, what we see in Japanese chess is they are not discs. They are this wedge shape, um, they are, but they're still flat. Now, what, what works for shogi is, um, and we'll cover why they both look the same color because that's also important in a moment, but um, how you know what direction a piece is going is based on the point. Um, now, you can't easily see it here, but they're not just flat, they are tapered a little bit. So they taper to the point. I don't know why, believe me, when I've tried making shogi pieces, that has added a lot of difficulty because I would love to just make the, sh the, the wedge shape and slice them, just slice them out of wood. But no, they all have to be this, this, inch, this little taper because probably it's very artistic. Um, but the benefit of either, they could have done it with a disc, but the benefit of this shape is you can easily flip it over. And when you flip it over, you reveal a different character inscribed on the other side, and that will now show you what the new movement is. Um, now, in the larger shogi variants, which there are many in history, um, Again, nearly every piece can promote and promotion is done by flipping over the pieces. There is a variety of new, often um, very different moves that are not seen at the beginning of the game. There is no promotion zone though. Um, promoting is permitted when a piece makes a capture, but only then. And it is, at least in most of the variants I've read about, is mandatory upon capture, which would play into a strategy. If you do not want to lose the credibility of this piece, you have to consider if capturing it is worth it. The other unique rule that really makes Shogi very interesting is the dropping rule. So as we know, most chess around the world is two armies with identical pieces in different colors. If you capture a piece, it is removed from the game permanently. The only exception would be if you need to say, bring that piece back in because a pawn promoted. Capture and shogi is not like that at all. It's capture and dropping. So you start with two identical pieces, mostly. Technically the king pieces are different. You have the Osho and the Gyokusho, the great general, the, um, the king general and the jewel general, which have only slightly different looking characters, but essentially they're the same. Every other piece is the same. I don't just mean they're equivalent. I mean, they look the same because there's no difference in color. They're all, usually shogi is sort of a beige, if they maybe just natural wood color with black for, for regular and red for promotion inscribed Chinese characters on them. But basically when you pull out, pull out the shogi pieces, you just find the right number for your side and the right number for the opponent's side. You don't divvy them up via color because there is no color. The point of the wedge is how, as I said, is how you know um, whose piece it is. The point faces away from the controlling player. Now this is useful because if you capture your opponent's piece or they capture yours, the piece capture goes into the opponent's hand. Then on a, on a later turn, as their turn, a captured piece may be placed back on the board. This is called dropping. Now that is a huge difference between chess. If you capture an opponent's piece, it adds to your potential future army. If you lose your own piece, you don't just lose that ability, you strengthen your opponent. Now you might gain it back, who knows? Um, when you drop a piece, it drops in at its original value. Whether it was promoted or not, it comes back in as its original value. Um, if you drop a piece in a promotional zone, it must move to promote. Otherwise that would be really, really um, <laughs> a little too powerful there. Um, but that also means that since you have to drop a piece um, uh, and then you have to drop a piece and then move it to be able to promote, 
And there are some pieces that can, have to promote if they get into places where they can't move. There are some pieces that you are, pro you are prohibited from dropping in a way that would never let them move. Um, we'll cover that in detail in just a moment. Um, because of this, you must always keep your piece visible to your opponent. Your captured piece is visible to your opponent. They are basically just sitting on the board, visible so that they, your opponent knows what you may bring back into the game. Um, here are the, some of the details on the restrictions. Um, uh, you can't drop the Fujio or the Kyosha. We'll cover them in detail on the final rank. This is because they they need to promote on the final rank. They can't actually move. Um, the 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 Kema needs the final two ranks um, for uh, probably also because it would become difficult for movement. Um, you cannot place two Fujio in the same file. Um, that's the same. Uh, basically vertical rows. Um, it's basically what's considered dishonorable to cause a Fujio to check a king. I don't know how much of that is a rule, um, but uh, generally it's just, just you don't, you shouldn't, you, sh you can use a foot soldier upon to check a king, but not by dropping in out of nowhere. Um, and this should probably say including 16th century, I'm sorry. Uh, dropping only exists in the later period games. It does exist in the shogi that was invented by the end of SCA period, barely. But um, this dropping rule was, was, was basically considered what, um, what brought about the modern game, um, which has now been being played for several centuries in Japan. Uh, so it was the late 16th century that the dropping rule came into place and the game that we basically call Shogi sort of rose. And there's speculation on what it, how it came about. Some was that um, it was representing the fact that during this time period, because we know the 16th century was full of lots of internal strife in Japan. So um, a, one defeated um, a daimyo or lord or potential shogun, their army would become absorbed by the other person's army. And there was also lots of mercenaries who were hired by whoever could afford them. So maybe that inspired the changing hands. Like if you capture your opponents, you, if you capture your opponent, you, you basically gain their army. I don't know. I mean, stuff like that happens around the world, but it is unique. All right, so we still have a little bit of time. Um, now that I've covered the biggest difference in the rules, and I'm going to tell you, I can teach you how to play. I can't teach a strategy. I am no good strategy. I have taught Shogi and lost to people. I've, taught, I've, I've, I've looked at this game for now um, almost two decades and other chess variants. I have taught them to people and lost. I am not a good strategist. I'm just fascinated by the history and all that. So, um, now we come into the craziness, although we'll start pretty subtle. Shogi, including all its variants, have hundreds of different pieces. Um, so we kind of look at this as trying to categorize pieces by the, how they move. And some pieces have more than one category of movement. Now, if you think about European chess, you could do the same thing here. In European chess, you have um, you have your just basic steppers, one step. The pawns take only one step, ignoring their first rule. The kings take only one step, ignoring the, um, the castle rule. Uh, you have your range movers. Um, those can take an unlimited number of spaces in particular directions. The rooks, um, orthogonal, the bishops, diagonal, the queen in any direction. And finally, you have your jumpers. Those are your knights. They can jump to particular spaces. Technically, it's sort of an L shape, or you could say um, one space forward, then one space di diagonal forward. But they're all, but the, but they basically only do one. Pawns are only stepper. Pawns and kings only steppers. Rooks, bishops, and queens on, only range movers. Yes, range could consider dudes doing one step, but it's still a range movement, just a one step range and knights can only jump. 
Also, we noticed that all of this, with the exception of the pawns, is completely symmetrical. Um, if they, um, if there's rooks can move in any orthogonal direction, bishops any diagonal direction, kings any direction, knights they can jump to, to that L shape in any direction as long as it's permissible. That's not going to be the case here. Now we start off. Um, we'll see that more in a minute. So going back to the details of the shogi pieces. Stepping, as we said, is just what one step in any direction. Most shogi pieces do this. Jumping is also jumping to its particular spaces. Again, we're familiar with that. Um, there are more jumping pieces in shogi, and although the main one in the main shogi looks a lot like how our knight jumps, they don't all jump in the sort of L shape. Some of them will jump in a straight line or a diagonal. And we also have ranging. Now those are normal. Um, we uh, just like what we have for, for range movement. Then we have multiple steppers. Luckily, most of the rest of these are covered are going to be in the later, larger variants of shogi, not the main shogi, but they're fun. So multiple steppers, they can move in um, usually very specific directions, but up to whatever number of steps, two, three, sometimes more. These are not jumps. So, that, so um, it's not a jump, it's not a slide, so it's not range movement. Um, some pieces are, are restricted, so they have to continue moving in that direction. Like once you move one space forward, if you want to continue moving, it has to be forward. You can't then also move left or right. Um, then we have the lion which is not in many pieces, but we might as, but it's basically named after the, the where it comes from, the shishi, the lion piece. It has, so there are others that have the full or partial movement of lion. So this piece can act like a multiple stepper or a jumper and is often permitted to return to its original space. Um, uh, as a multiple stepper, it can um, also change direction mid-step. Um, and it can make multiple captures in one turn, which again is unlike most other pieces. If you look at the diagram, so the lion can first take a step to anywhere on any A space, and then it can take a step to any adjacent space, another A space back to the origin, back to its origin, or to a B space. Um, so it can change direction and go there, uh, or it can just jump to a B space, jump over pieces in the way. Now, actually going back to its home space, that is very powerful because that means you essentially pass your turn and chess, most chess variants don't let you do that. They don't let you pass because if your one strategy is trying to make your opponent break their formation and compromise whatever defenses or offenses they have going. Well, if you like your position, you can basically pass or even capture and then go back to your position, not breaking your formation. The lions are considered very, very powerful and in, it's their, and in the main variant they exist in, they are the most powerful piece. But they get weirder. You have your range jumpers. They move like what we think of a rook or a bishop, except that they can also jump over other pieces. Uh, there are some restrictions on they can only jump over lower ranking pieces. Um, they, so they're, everything historical is probably different rules happen 10 miles down the road. So some will say that the jumpers can only, um, can only do this while making a capture. So they can't just move to do it. You have to be capturing. Similar, you have your hook movers. They're like a chess piece, like, like a rook or a bishop, except they can take one 90 degree turn. If you think about that, that means that on an infinite size board, a, a rook-like moving hook mover could reach any piece in one turn on an empty board, I should say. All right, now let's look at the specific pieces. And um, we're gonna first cover the ones that are associated with basic shogi. Um, you have your Osho, your king general, or your Gokusho, your jade general. Um, these are your opposing king pieces. These are the ones that their movement is pretty much identical to most forms of chess, including Western European chess, one step in any direction. You do not want to put, you, you, you can't literally say, you can't 
put it in, put the piece in check. You can't leave the piece in check. And checkmating the opponent's piece brings victory. Checkmating the piece brings victory to the other player. That's pretty simple. Next, we have your king shot, your gold general. Now we start to see a lack of some symmetry here. Um, so each player starts with two uh, gold generals. Um, they are the companions to the king piece. So you, so this is essentially the cousin to our queen. Now, yes, we think about our queen as having unlimited free movement, but that's because the queen developed that late in SCA period. Most early variants of chess around the world, the, the king's companion had very limited movement. Um, basically the same as the king with a few with a few restrictions. So here we see that this piece is almost as powerful as the king, but doesn't have quite the same versatility. Um, so in regular shogi, most of the pieces that promote will promote to have a movement that is the equivalent to this kinsho movement. Next, we have your ginsho. This is your silver generals. And you also start with two of them sitting next to the kinsho. These are the ones I mentioned that are most likely inspired by the kon of uh, Thai chess, um, which makes them the relative of the elephant of Indian chess and thus the bishop of, of European chess. And again, the bishop having the range motion that we're familiar with today is a very late period addition. That did not arise until, um, that, that did not arise for, well, well after Shogi was introduced to Japan. Um, so here, if we, especially if we look at the two in comparison, we see that have some similarities in movement, but they're also restricted. Um, the Ginsho can be considered, which probably helped inspire the, the Silver General's movement, probably helped inspire how Japan modified the Gold General's movement. But the Silver General essentially can move one step in any diagonal direction or one step forward. Now we, now we see what the Gold General looks like, which is one step in any orthogonal direction or one step in any forward direction, including diagonals. These two, these two heavily complement each other because of where their strengths and weaknesses lie. Um, if the silver general promotes, it gains the movements of a gold general. Next to them, you have the kima, audible horses. Each player starts with two. These are the equivalent um, cousin to the Western European Western European chess knight. Um, it is also the only piece in regular shogi that can jump, and it jumps in a forward direction and only forward, not left, not right, not back, similar to our horse. So there we see see in the diagram the movement, but only forward. This is why this piece has to promote when it reaches the eighth or ninth rank because it can no longer move at that point. Because unlike our knight it can't move backwards. Um, it's powerful because it can jump, but it's limited as a forward attacker because you can't move it back to defend unless you capture one and put it back into, your, into play. When it promotes, it also gains the power of a gold general, which as we see with some of these pieces, you might question how early you want to promote some of them because the gold general has a lot of movement ability, but can't jump. Finally, the last piece in the in the in the in the back rank is the kill shot fragrant chariot or the yari lance. Again, each player starts with two. These appear in the rear corners of the board, and these thus they take the place of the chariot piece, which makes them a cousin to our rook. Now, we'll cover it in a moment. You do see a piece that's often transliterated from Japanese chess as rook as a different piece. I don't like doing that and I'll explain why, but this piece here is in fact the direct descendant of the chariot from Indian chess, which became with no movement change, the rook of European chess. No, I'm sorry, rook, um, Arabic rook, <laughs> um, the rook of European chess. But when chess went through China, China thought the rook was too powerful because remember they didn't have a queen movement back then. Also, they didn't have a bishop movement. The rook, the chariot, was the only range moving piece. So it was by far the most powerful. 
Um, should be a side note. Uh, um, uh, Middle Eastern chess considered the rook so powerful that it was often customary to basically say check rook in addition to saying check king. Um, so when China got, got the chariot piece, they felt it was too powerful for the game, so limited it to only a forward motion. And that was the rule that came over to Japan. Eventually, China, through further influence with other parts of the world, decided to reintroduce the rook to its, to its um, uh, reintroduce the chariot to the rook-like motion that we know today, including in Chinese chess today. But by this point, Japan was used to having a forward only rook. Um, so this, so the chair, this fragrant chariot can move in any number of unobstructed spaces forward and only forward, hence why it's a lance. And this is why it must promote when reaching the final rank because it can't move anymore. Um, that being said, there's no reason why you shouldn't promote it when it reaches the second to final rank because you can only move one space forward again. Um, when it promotes, it promotes into a goal general, which again, you may question, do you want to lose that range motion yet? The final piece of the earliest shogi, the final piece that was directly um, built off of Chinese chess is the Fu Hill, the foot soldier. And like most games of, of chess, it is a, a wall of low ranking foot soldiers right up front. Uh, in Japanese chess, they can only take one step forward. That's also how they capture. There's no diagonal capture. There's no ampassant rule. There's no double first step. They just capture by moving forward. Um, if you reach the final, basically with this one, as soon as you cross, cross in, into the promotion zone, you should promote it because you lose nothing because it, um, it promotes into basically a gold general. So you still have the movement the pawn had, and now you have a bunch of additional movement. And this is actually where it becomes a very important piece, um, also called the Tolkien. As a promoted pawn gains the ability of a gold general, which is considered one of the most versatile pieces in Shogi. But if your opponent captures a promoted pawn, your opponent can only put the piece back into the game as a pawn. You don't want to lose your actual gold generals because they're important to your defense, especially of your king pieces. And you don't want your opponent to get a gold general because they are only a gold general and they will go back in the game as a gold general. But with a, with a promoted pawn, you can have all the abilities of a gold general with little of the risk. If you lose the piece, you only lose a pawn to your opponent. You don't lose a gold general. And your opponent is very limited in where they can play that piece because they can only play a pawn on a rank where they don't have pawns, which means they can only play a pawn if they've already lost or promoted one of their own pawns. All right. Now I've saved these for last because historically they came last. The earliest Japanese chess did not have the next two pieces, the Hisha and the Kakugyo. These were inspired by a later waves from China. And when they came to Japan, Japan thought they were just brand new pieces. But what this is, is the Hisha, the flying chariot, was actually China reintroducing their chariot piece to the rook motion that we know. But when China got it, Sorry, when Japan got it, they just decided it was a new piece and they conveniently had a blank space on the board to put it. So the Hisha, it moves like a rook, any direction, um, um, left, right, forward, back. But you only have one because it was a new piece. They did not add two of them, only one of them. And I'll, I'll cover promotion in a moment. So to balance out the board, they decided to have the Kakugyo the angle mover. So basically what you have is you have one of each of these, one of a rook-like piece and one of a bishop-like piece. The, the, the angle mover can move in any, un, any number of unobstructed um, uh, spaces diagonally. Now, you will see this piece usually transliterated as bishop, as a rook, and the kakugyo as bishop. I don't like doing that because I think it actually belittles 
the ingenuity of Japan, because this is not related to our bishop at all. As you see, most of these pieces, they had very interesting names. Gold general, silver general, laudable horse, um, uh, fragrant chariot, flying chariot, and then we have angle mover. Okay, the name might not be very, um, very uh, impressive, but I think what that says to us is they just came up with it. They, and they saw the rook-like moving piece of later Chinese chess. They adopted it, but wanted, wanted to have an equivalent diagonal piece, so invented one. This predates the um, European rules for the, the modern European rules for the bishop by centuries. So Japan, this is not a bishop. This is earlier than a bishop. And no, the bishop isn't inspired by this because there wasn't enough cultural contact. But this is its own unique piece because Japan decided to be inventive. When you promote a hisha, it retained its own movement, but then also um, gains the movement of basically a king. So it can move in one space in any direction, one step in any direction, or a range motion like a rook. And the opposite, the or the, the partner is. Um, the angle mover promotes into a real Uma, a dragon horse, which again retains its diagonal movement, but also promotes into a, um, uh, has the king movement, so it can take one step in any direction. And there you have all of the main pieces for what we consider modern day shogi. But those aren't the only pieces that we will see historically. Um, just before the modern, modern age, we have the uh, Suizo, the drunk elephant, which promotes into the Taishi, the crown prince. So the, um, this is from, from the variant that we, we historically call shogi, which means small shogi. It is the direct predecessor of modern shogi. It was played through, up, up through the 16th century, although you can still play it today. Um, because of this, uh, this piece, the dropping rule was not into effect, but promotion rules were still. So capture pieces were removed from the game and not brought back. Um, each player began with one suizo. It stood, it stood in front of the king piece. Um, it, uh, if it promoted into, a, in, it basically had a very king-like um, movement, except it could not go backwards. When it promoted into the crown prince, it could take one step in any direction which was the equivalent to the king's, king's movement, but it also made it second king, as in you had to capture or checkmate both of them. You, you could now capture a king, but you could, um, as long as you still had a crown prince in play or vice versa, um, which is why you can't drop them back in. Now, I don't know why a drunk elephant promotes into a crown prince other than jokingly saying, you let a crown prince do whatever he wants, and you definitely let a drunk elephant do whatever he wants. So now the handouts um, that if you want to download, the, um, uh, the ones I've mentioned at the beginning of the class, they have, um, uh, I also included two PDFs that I made of a printable board layout and printable paper version of the pieces. I did include all the pieces I just mentioned. So if you wanted to print those out, you can have your own modern day shogi set and also a Tai shogi set, sorry, a show shogi set with the Suizo Tai Shi piece. And we don't have a lot of time, but I want to go through some of the other great, the other interesting pieces they had, some of the variants. Um, just like I said that Japan came up with the bishop movement, they also came up with the queen movement centuries before the Western Queen. Um, basically, it's called a free king because it moves like a king, but it can range move in any direction. It was not the most powerful piece in that game because, as I mentioned earlier, oops, let's skipped it. Um, okay, I mentioned earlier the lion piece um, that was considered more powerful in in these variants. Then we have this, which I don't even have a lot of time to go into. <laughs> um, this is literally a fire demon. And yes, that's its movement pattern down there. Um, the red squares on it, those are where it will burn an opponent piece. If it lands next to you, 
opponent pieces are burned and you can't stop in that space or it will be burned. In addition, it's also a, it's also a multi-step mover and a diagonal mover. And, you, and, and the only version of this exists, which is literally called exotic shogi, you start with two of them. Um, I've seen some documentation that says that, that your goal at the beginning of that game is to just get rid of your opponent's fighter demons. Um, this one's just sort of interesting because you start with, um, it's the only promotional piece. Um, it's the rare piece I've seen where you are not allowed to step into any of the adjacent squares. Instead, your piece can jump to where I have the um, open circles but in diagonally, after it jumps, it can then range move. Um, you have your emperor. You can teleport. I'm not joking. In some of the larger versions of Shogi, you have an emperor piece. Sometimes you have to promote into one. Sometimes you start with one. And it can move to any square on the board in one move. But that movement is limited because um, it can only capture. It can only make a capture of an opponent piece if that piece is not protected. Uh, so it can't put itself in the check, of course. Um, and if you have two emperors, technically they're protecting all their other pieces. So there's limitations. But still, it can teleport. Anyway, let's go through quickly some of the boards um, because it's fascinating. Uh, and just a few minutes left, so I'm going to hurry up and get through that. Oh, okay, actually, tell you clock, but I'll try to be really quick. Um, Heian Shogi, this is the earliest Shogi that we know in Japan. We don't have, we don't have um, evidence of all the rules, but we can extrapolate from later period. Uh, we think that they were both 8x8 eight by, eight by eight and 8x9 eight boards. So some may have only had one um, gold general, which is very much like most kinds of chess that only have one king. But they probably all still had the pawns pushed forward. A show shogi is the most common variant leading through SCA period into the 16th century, um, replaced by just taking out, out, out the drunk elephant crown prince. Um, as you see, it's nine by nine. It has the space. It has everything that you would normally see. Show shogi means small shogi. Then we have chu shogi. Now, um, I'm going to take just a brief moment to say a lot of cultures tried to improve the game of chess, but what they usually did was add more pieces. But if they added one new type of piece, they wanted to add two of them. And they and thus they would have would have just made the board 10 wide as opposed to the normal eight. But if you're gonna make it 10 wide, you want to keep it square so you make it 10 deep. The problem is this now makes it even longer for the slow moving pieces to reach each other. Japan decided let's keep our armies close together and just add a whole bunch of pieces in the middle. So Chushogi, which is many people consider the most successful large variant of chess, it is still actively played today in Japan, is basically that. It is really um, a really playable, very interesting, uh, lots of unique pieces um, game. Some of the ones we're about to cover may not be as playable. This is the exotic Shogi. This is the strange one. This is the one that, again, is now 16 by 16, has fire demons, has other weirdness in it, has the range jumpers. We like, okay, you like big boards. 15 by 15, probably played in a go board. More pieces being added. Here we go, 19 by 19, because why not? Oh, 25 by 25, just fill in all the squares. Um, I forget the numbers I had, and they might be in the handout, but um, there's, I think, a hundred, there's well over a hundred different pieces, different piece movements in this game. And um, I think you start with over a hundred different pieces and you get almost 200 when you count promotion. I used to think this was the biggest. Apparently I was wrong. I don't have a, I didn't make a graphic, but there's a 36 by 36. Yes, they exist. Why? Are they playable? Questionable. Um, a, lot of, a lot of theory is that these larger variants, especially when you consider what some of the pieces were named after, were basically invented by Buddhist monks. Some of it was done as, me as meditation. Um, just making the game, thinking about the game, setting up the game was 
could be a meditative ritual. They did try to play them though. We do have records that they were attempted to be played. How successful? Who knows? The 25 by 25 tie shogi could have thousands of moves. It was often played like a like a, a war that had skirmishes, little battles here and there because you couldn't think of the whole board at once. And this is modern, it's not period. But you can also play shogi on some small boards, which is some sometimes have different rules. It is pretty cute. Um, this is some of from my old notes, just to show you some of the some of the interesting piece movements and how it's not entirely um, symmetrical. How they can have different movements. Um, some are huge movements, some are smaller movements, some are primarily left movements or right movements or forward movements or backwards movements. Some just have really wide ranges, even if they're not a range mover. There's a teleporter, there's hook movers. And few can only basically move left and right. Um, so yeah, that's Shogi. Um, this is uh, the bibliography I used, um, which is hopefully in the handout so that you can better get than looking at whatever's on the Zoom screen right now. Um, I was very beneficial that uh, the local public library when they're open has uh, a great collection of various chess documents. Um, I live in Cleveland, very near the Cleflands. Um, so it's a great reference section. I don't know how, how readily available some of these books are. Um, I forget which ones right now, but I found some information in some of these books that I've never found evidence of a book anywhere else, just because they're not that common in at least translated or just that common in English. Luckily, we have a great library. So I do encourage you to go look for them. Um, but if you have any problems finding some of them, ask me and I'll see if I can help. Um, and finally, I wanted to end with this adorable cuteness, which I originally found because I also teach this class at anime conventions, which usually has a lot more anime references in there because anime loves shogi. All right, I'm going to stop my screen share now. And, um, we are now just past eight, um, so I should probably wrap up. Um, I don't know if our uh, kind rum chancellor here who's been helping facilitate this, if um, they have the Facebook group open and if there's any questions that have popped up. There were not any questions, but I will post. I, I went ahead and copied all your oh, links and I'll put as soon as I get done with this screen, I'll post all them right, there. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. If you do have any questions, uh, um, you can always reach me at Lazzi, um, L-A-Z-Z-I at case.edu, um, L-A-Z-Z-I at case.edu, and I'll be glad to answer them. Um, once I remember to, I lead a very busy life, and it's now the holidays, but I will try to remember that. Um, you have permission to poke me more than once, uh, but I would love to help um, uh, any more information to help you track down, down that. I can send you the files if necessary. And uh, I also study other chess, so I'll do that too. And I'm definitely always willing to learn um, because I do not actually know, uh, and of course I don't know everything about chess. I don't know all the variants out there. Um, I love to learn new stuff. So if you know anything about show your other chess variants you wanna share, please let me know. This uh, was one of my original passions in the SCA and I just love teaching Shogi. It was also the first class I taught this year uh, the right like the first weekend of 2020 when I thought I'd be going to lots of events so I thought it's a good way to wrap up 2020 <laughs> and teach it as my last class as well all right I think that's all I've got for now and um, now that I've got my voice sore I get to go act with a fake accent um, again I want to thank the rum staff for having me and and for letting me teach and all of you who are uh, who watch this class or may watch the video that goes up later um, are there any final things to say since I guess this is the last rum session of 2020? Is that right? Yeah, we're, we're pretty much at the All end right. of it. So happy winter break, everyone! <laughs> <laughs>